On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, let's read Atari Age, the first issue from May and June of 1982, and the last issue from March and April of 1984. All right, before we get started with this episode, I just wanted to quickly acknowledge that over the holidays, the channel passed 100,000 subscribers. So I just want to give a quick thanks to all of you who have helped make that possible over the last five plus years. Now, a couple of months ago, I got a request from a viewer who wanted me to do a Let's Read on a magazine from back in the Atari days. So I hopped on eBay and was able to find the entire run of Atari Age for something like $70, which I didn't think was a bad deal. So uh, today we're going to check out two issues of Atari Age, the first issue and the last issue. And the reason for that is that they are very thin magazines. They're both less than 20 pages long. Now, uh, I'm 41 as I record this, so I was a very small child uh, during the time we're going to be talking about today. So while I did play some of these games either back at that time or shortly afterwards, I won't be talking about these games with the same level of first-person knowledge that I do uh, 8 and 16-bit games and beyond. That being said, the Atari 2600 is one of my all-time favorite game systems, so I am really excited to check out these magazines. So, let's check them out. Alright, so real quick, let's just explain what this Atari Age magazine is. Think uh, Nintendo Power or Sega Visions. Basically, you joined the Atari Club and you would get sent this bi-monthly magazine. Uh, you know, this is the first issue for May and June of 1982, and then the last issue was March and April of 84, so it, it wasn't a magazine with a whole lot of legs. Anyway, as you can see on the cover here, uh, the, the cover art is made up with the box art slash label art of some of the Atari games uh, of the day. This is back in a time when label art was actually uh, drawn and painted by hand, and it was pretty common with the Atari for this uh, watercolor style to be used, and uh, then opening it to the inside cover. Uh, again, it's only 12 pages, so they really kind of get started. And that's 12 pages, including the cover, by the way. Uh, although I guess it's 14 pages if you include the back cover. Uh, but the first thing they've gotten here uh, is this interview with Pac-Man. You know, I, I never cared for stuff like this. I think even when I was a kid, I would have thought this was kind of stupid. So uh, uh, it goes without saying that we're just going to skip over that. Uh, over here, you've got a letter from the editor. This being the first issue, they just want to kind of introduce the magazine and what it's going to be all about. As you might imagine, it's going to be Atari news, previews, and reviews. So uh, nothing really groundbreaking there. Uh, by the way, the editor is this guy named Steve Morgenstern, who uh, I've never heard of, so I don't know if he ever moved on to anything else in the uh, world of uh, video game journalism. And then over here, they have a, a you know very abbreviated uh, uh, table of contents. Well, they say it goes up to page 16, so I think that might include a little insert uh, in the back, and then, of course, includes the back cover. And then here they have uh, Atari International, which is just some international news. Here they uh, they talk about an asteroids, uh, a worldwide asteroids competition they had. That's pretty cool. This was actually asteroids on the Atari 2600 and not the arcade cabinet. The uh, winner was a kid named Andy Breyer from Chicago, so, you know, making America proud there, Andy. I don't know if you're still out there. Uh, Andy won a $5,000 scholarship, so uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, Asteroids is definitely a game that I remember playing uh, in the arcade. Uh, definitely a very cool game. Uh, it was released in the arcade uh, back in 1979 and uh, was uh, a game that used vector graphics. We're actually going to talk about several games uh, between this issue and the other one, uh, where in the arcade the games used uh, vector graphics instead of raster graphics, which is what... Uh, most games use, like a standard CRT. And uh, the game was designed by Ed Log, who also did uh, Centipede and Millipede. And, um, you know, it's going to be the case for many of these games that we're going to talk about that they are arcade ports. And I'm going to show arcade footage and I'm going to show some Atari 2600 footage. But uh, what I'm not going to do is get really into talking about uh, is this game, you know, better at home or better in the arcade? Like, it should go without saying that in most cases, the uh, Atari home version was, uh, at best, a best approximation uh, of the arcade game. 
Asteroids was this really nice looking, although monochrome, uh, vector graphics game. And uh, at home it wasn't, you know, and in the arcade, uh, Asteroids had, you know, it didn't even use a joystick, it just used multiple buttons. And at home it used the standard Atari joystick with one button on it. But what I will say, aside from the fact that the game had quite a bit of flicker, the uh, home game, in my opinion, was a, was a pretty good approximation of the arcade game. And the home game was in color, whatever that's worth. Other things they talk about here on the first page, uh, I guess, I don't know why in Puerto Rico of all places, uh, I mean, not there's anything wrong with Puerto Rico, but I don't know why they chose Puerto Rico to build this Atari robot that they apparently took around and rolled around shopping malls to try to get people to buy Ataris down there. And then over here they talk about a Space Invaders competition that uh, they had in South Africa. And I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, it says 1,500 video game enthusiasts blasted away at scores of threatening Space Invaders in the first South African Atari tournament. And it says that competitors paid 30 cents each to enter the tournament, which is pretty cool because that's barely more than just playing the arcade game yourself. And, uh, and yeah, and they said that the uh, entry fees were donated, uh, donated to charity. So I don't know if that means that the person who won, who in this case was Martin Jacklin, uh, I don't know if that means that he didn't get uh, a prize. It doesn't mention anyway. I think it bears, you know, uh, you know, taking a minute and talking about Space Invaders because it really is a very important release uh, on the Atari. It was released in the arcades in uh, 1978 by uh, Taito in Japan. It was uh, designed by a guy named uh, uh, Tomohiro Nishikado and uh, was extremely popular. And Atari was able to get uh, the rights to uh, a home version and uh, they programmed themselves the, the home version for the Atari 2600. And it was really like the first killer app that the system had. Like the, the Atari came out in 77 and you know, it, it did okay, I guess. But uh, when Space Invaders, which was this huge arcade hit, was released on the Atari, it quadrupled the sales of the console and it ended up selling something like 2 million cartridges in its first year. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that Space Invaders replaced Combat as the pack-in game for the Atari. So many of those 2 million cartridges may have been in the form of a pack-in. But it was really why people, a lot of people, were buying the system in the first place. All right, here we get into more Atari news. And here they're talking about uh, some games that they have acquired the rights to release in the home. And the two games they have here are Phoenix and Vanguard. And uh, Phoenix is definitely a very cool game, sort of similar to, to Space Invaders in that it's one of these sort of fixed shooters where you're just, uh, you can go left and right at the bottom of the screen and there's formations of enemies uh, up above. And uh, the difference is here that the enemies are moving up and down quickly uh, you don't have anything to hide behind, but you can pull back on your joystick, at least in the home version, and that gives you a shield. Uh, I would guess that probably, I haven't played the arcade version uh, on an actual cabinet, uh, but it probably had its own dedicated shield button. But, you know, if you were about to get hit, you could activate the shield real quick that would save your life. And uh, it had like sort of three different stages, if you will, although really I guess it was, it was more than that. But uh, like for the first couple of boards, you had just these uh, certain kind of little alien enemies that could, they would quickly fly out of formation and get real close to you and then fly back up. And then in the second phase, or, or whatever you want to call it, there were these birds that would fly just back and forth, left to right on the screen, uh, just dropping bombs on you. And what was cool about those birds was that in order to kill them, you actually had to shoot them like in their body. Like if you shot one of their wings, you would just shoot the wing off but uh, you wouldn't kill them, so you actually had to shoot them like in, in their body in order to kill them. And then uh, Phoenix actually had something sort of like a boss battle, if you want to call it that, where after you got past the birds, there was this boss fight, and then after that it would just loop back uh, to, the, to the first aliens. Uh, of course, it would just get harder and harder, but, uh, but pretty neat game. And then the other game they've got here, which I do remember playing back in the day, uh, both in the arcade and on the Atari 5200, is Vanguard. And uh, Vanguard was pretty cool because it was a scrolling shooter rather than a fixed screen shooter. And it had levels that scrolled horizontally. It had levels that scrolled sort of vertically. Like in the home, it was horizontally and vertically on the Atari 2600. But uh, in the arcade, 
it the first level scrolled uh, horizontally, and then the second level scrolled kind of diagonally, which was pretty neat. And uh, in the arcade, uh, Vanguard had like a four-way joystick for uh, moving your guy, and then it had four buttons that were in sort of a diamond formation that you would use to fire your laser in each of the four directions, and that was pretty neat. But uh, obviously they couldn't do that on the 2600, so at home you would just fire your laser in whatever direction you were pushing uh, the joystick. So uh, so that was pretty neat. And then uh, Vanguard also had these little, I don't know what it was called, it just said energy, and it was this little thing you could kind of fly through that would make you invincible for something like 10 seconds. And then you could no longer fire your laser, but then you could just run into enemies and kill them. Down here they talk about these Atari computer camps. They actually had summer camps where uh, you would learn how to program Atari uh, 8-bit computers, the 400 and 800. And uh, that sounds pretty cool. You know, when I was a kid, uh, older than this, probably about eight years later, I got really into home computers, and I would have killed to go something like a, to something like a summer camp. And then uh, over here we've got the EEPROM report, which uh, that's kind of a weird name for an article, but they're just using that as an excuse to talk about some games that are coming out. Uh, and the one they're talking about here first is Defender. And uh, when people think about uh, the really great games from the golden era of the arcades, Defender is often mentioned as one of the best, if not the best, game uh, of that time. The game was designed by uh, Eugene Jarvis, who is probably one of the most recognizable names in uh, at least game designers from that, uh, that age. And uh, once again, this is a, a side-scrolling uh, shooter but uh, the play field actually loops around. And uh, the basic point of the game is uh, you've got all these alien invaders coming down, and uh, the bottom of the screen is like the surface of the planet, and there are all these humanoids on the surface that the aliens are trying to kidnap uh, while they're also trying to kill you. And uh, the ultimate point of the game is to uh, save as many of the humanoids as you can and to kill all the aliens. So once you've killed all the aliens, you move on to the next stage. Unfortunately, the home port of uh, of Defender on the Atari was really not very good. And um, part of that is due to the fact that the game was actually fairly complicated in the arcade. Uh, as far as the number of controls that it used, it really wasn't possible to um, replicate it uh, on the home Atari using only one controller. And we'll talk about how they got around that uh, for another game later on in this episode. But uh, the game also just had a ton of flicker and uh, just really didn't look very good. I don't, I don't know who programmed the home version of Defender, but uh, it definitely didn't turn out uh, very well, unfortunately. Now, uh, one thing I did want to quickly mention is that if you have a PlayStation 4, there's a PSN game called Rezogun that uh, is basically a modern rethinking of uh, the original Defender and uh, I want to say that game was available maybe even when the PS4 launched, but uh, it is an absolutely outstanding game. And uh, if you haven't checked out Rezogun, I can't imagine it's very expensive. It's just a digital download, uh, as I said, a PSN game. And if you haven't checked it out, you definitely should do so. Over here, uh, they've got an ad for uh, the, well, not an ad, but uh, a little news bit about the Atari 5200 which uh, they said, you know, new advanced home game system unveiled. And the Atari 5200 is actually the first home game system I ever played because, uh, you know, when I was maybe around this age or maybe a year older, uh, my best friend got one. I think I was in, like, the first grade, so that would have been in, like, 1983. You know, definitely a cool system. Uh, it's very large, and uh, the controllers are sort of problematic. And then down here they mention the Clubhouse Store, where you can buy Atari items by mail and phone, and uh, they have ads in here, you know, listing out some of the things you could buy. Uh, basically, you could just buy Atari games directly from Atari and maybe save a little bit of money, and that way you could also pre-order a game. So yeah, you could pre-order video games all the way back in 1982. And then they mention down here existing cartridges like the classic Maze Craze, can be hard to find in local stores, but the Clubhouse store always has the complete selection on hand. So, I mean, that makes a good point. You know, this was a, you know, Maze Craze was a game that came out in like 1978. And so, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that it's no longer something you're going to be able to find uh, at the store. Uh, down here, we're going to talk about Battlezone uh, more when we get to the other issue that we're going to talk about uh, today. But I'll just mention it here only because uh, they mention it. 
Uh, you know, Battlezone was uh, another vector-based Atari uh, arcade game where uh, it was like a first-person tank game. It was actually a pretty cool game. It actually had like a periscope uh, sight type thing that you actually put your face up to. And uh, cool game, but uh, they actually made a version of the game called, I think it was called the Bradley Trainer for the army. Like the army commissioned them to to make this and they made uh, only two cabinets. I don't know. I just thought that was pretty neat. Uh, apparently of the two cabinets, one of them is actually in the hands of some kind of collector. So, uh, and the other one, I guess nobody knows where it is. So maybe the, maybe the army has it in a warehouse somewhere or something. I don't really know. Uh, and then they mention, uh, that, uh, uh, well, I guess they kind of don't mention it. They say evil auto is coming. Don't know who evil auto is. Ask a friend who plays coin video games about this dangerous smiling character. And they're of course, uh, talking about berserk. And then, uh, down here under uh, coin video games, full color cosmic action and new 3d game. And the game they're talking about is uh, space duel. And uh, I had never played space duel before, uh, you know, sitting down to prepare to make this episode. And basically what space duel is, is a follow up to asteroids still uses vector graphics, but this time in full color. And, uh, they even mention here in the article that unlike asteroids, you could play this game two player simultaneous, which is uh, pretty cool. Space Duel was never released for any home system uh, back in the day, but uh, whenever it was that the Atari Flashback 2 came out, which by now might have been almost 10 years ago, they actually released a 2600 version of Space Duel uh, as an exclusive to that system. The, uh, the original uh, arcade game is really, really good, and uh, you should check it out. Like, you know, fire it up in MAME or something. Uh, oh, here we get to a, uh, a full article about uh, Maze Craze. Have you played Maze Craze today? Maze Craze is actually a pretty cool game, uh, if you've never checked it out. Uh, I think the full name is like Maze Craze, a game of cops and robbers. And when you turn it on, it just seems like, okay, it's a maze, like you would have seen in uh, like the comics page in the newspaper back in the day. But um, but the, the cool things about it, first of all, you could play it two player and you could race to the finish and that was pretty neat. But, um, you know, as was the case with most Atari games back in the day, it had like different like game modes or, or whatever you want to call it, where, uh, you know, you could hit the game select switch and uh, select a different game mode. And you could play like these cops and robbers versions of the game where you as the cop had to go like catch three robbers in the maze before you made it to the end. And that was pretty cool. And, uh, you know, I would guess, again, this was a game that was uh, four years old by this time. And maybe they were just sitting on a ton of copies and this was their way of trying to sell them. But uh, once again, it really is a cool game. Over here, they're uh, talking about some new games that are going to be coming out and mentioning once again that you could go ahead and order these games now and that they would ship them out to you when they were done. And those two games are uh, Yars Revenge and Defender. Yars Revenge was a game that was, you know, purpose designed uh, for the Atari 2600 by a guy named Howard Scott Warshaw. Of all of the games that Atari released exclusively for the home system, Yars Revenge was uh, was the top selling. And uh, I was a little bit surprised by that, only because, you know, Yars Revenge is a good game, but it's certainly not one of my absolute favorite games. But uh, it is very unique, and uh, it has a pretty cool gameplay mechanic. Uh, you, Your character is sort of this cyborg housefly, and uh, what you have to do is you have to destroy this thing called the Quotile, who is hiding behind this barrier. So, like, you have to shoot away the barrier. You uh, you bring out your Zorlon cannon, and then you can you can shoot uh, the Quotile. But the Quotile is moving up and down uh, on the screen, so he's not like sitting still. But definitely a cool game. Like I said, just maybe not one of my absolute favorites. Uh, next year, wow, we've got a, a two-page spread on Haunted House. And uh, this is another game that was purpose-designed for the Atari. And it's actually a pretty cool game. Uh, some people call Haunted House the original survival horror game. I don't know about that. But uh, it, it works kind of similarly to Adventure, where uh, you, know, you have your little character that you can move between screens. Uh, your little character in this game is just a set of eyeballs. And you're basically inside this mansion that has like three stories and a basement. And uh, each story has six rooms. 
and uh, you basically have to move around the entire mansion and find uh, three pieces of this urn. And once you put the urn together, you can just go out the front door and leave. And then you've you finished that level. And uh, if you just play the standard, like if you when you start up the system, the version of the game that's already there for you, it's okay. But um, if you go to, I don't remember what game number it is, nine or something, the last one, uh, the game gets way cooler because then all the lights are off. You can't see the walls anymore except when you have the, the lit match and then you can only see the little area right around you. And it, it turns it into a whole new game and makes it way better. Uh, you know, obviously the graphics are very rudimentary, but uh, Haunted House is actually a pretty cool game. Uh, here we get to the Clubhouse store. The things they have here, which I think are pretty cool, uh, they have the Atari Age poster, which is just a poster-sized version of the cover of this magazine. But the cover of this magazine is pretty cool. So, you know, I would, if I had that poster, man, I'd frame it and put it up in the basement or something. And then um, over here, they've got the uh, modular cartridge library, which I remember these too. These were neat because basically they were modular in that you could buy multiples of these and they, they were like interlocking, like they would slide together. So this held uh, 14 cartridges, but you know you could buy another one and snap it together or slide them together, and now you had enough room to hold 28 cartridges. And then over here, they've got the order form, and then here you can see uh, what games you could order, and uh, you could get Defender or Yars Revenge. Again, those were not out yet, but you could go ahead and order them. Defender was $37.95, and Yar's Revenge was thirty one ninety five. So I'll leave it to somebody else to do the math, uh, you know, adjust for inflation. But uh, you could also still buy again Maze Craze, which they had for twenty seven, and then they had Pac Man for thirty seven ninety five. Which, if you've ever played the original Pac Man on the Atari, it was really not a good game at all. And uh, so to charge thirty eight bucks for it is kind of insulting. But you know, same thing goes for uh, for Defender there. And uh, so then we get to the back cover here, I guess, which just has one of these uh, screen scrambles. So, you know, uh, whatever. So that is uh, the first issue of Atari Age from May and June of 82. And so now we'll check out the very last issue from uh, March and April of 1984. And uh, you can see on the cover here, they've got this big tank, uh, which I think is because the cover story here is uh, is Battle Zone. So hopefully we'll have a chance, oh yeah, it's right here, uh, to talk about that uh, a little bit. So yeah, here you go, Battle Zone. So this was part of this uh, video game master's competition, which was this competition that ran over uh, multiple issues of this magazine. But uh, I don't know if there's going to be an article about Battle Zone in here uh, later, so I'm just going to talk about it now. Uh, we already talked about it a little bit in, uh, you know, with the last issue, and uh, you know, I talked about a couple of games in, the, in that issue, that did not really successfully transition into the home. And Battlezone is an example of the opposite, in my opinion. Uh, I think Battlezone is one of the most impressive looking uh, Atari 2600 games. Maybe not, you know, I'm not going to say it's like the best game or anything, just because the gameplay is a little bit one dimensional. I mean, it's a fun game. It's not bad at all. And the game just looks really, really good and even doesn't sound too bad. So we'll move on here. Uh, new cartridge report. So I guess these are uh, games that are either out or are are coming out imminently. And the first one we've got here is uh, Millipede. So Millipede was, of course, the successor or sequel to Centipede in the arcade. Uh, very, very similar games, the two games. Uh, Millipede just sort of added some more enemies. And probably the biggest thing that Millipede added were these little uh, DDT bombs. So, uh, you know, for anybody that hasn't played Centipede or Millipede, you move around the bottom of the screen in the arcade, you move around using a trackball, which is really cool. And you only have one button, you have a fire button. And there's a centipede, or in this case, a millipede, snaking its way down the screen. And you have to kill all of the sections of it. And if you shoot it like halfway through, it splits off into two, uh, which makes it a little bit harder. But uh, the uh, this home version of Millipede on the 2600 in my opinion, was a pretty uh, decent port of the game. Uh, as I said, these games were uh, designed by Ed Logg, who also did uh, uh, did Asteroids. Over here is Crystal Castles. Uh, this is not a game that I've ever actually played uh, in the arcade, Crystal Castles. So uh, I can't say too much about it. Uh, it's like a pellet collection game, 
Crystal Castles, however, it's sort of pseudo 3D. It has this isometric view, and there are different levels that you move around on. Your character is this teddy bear. You move around, uh, you know, these paths, collecting up all these gems. But uh, there are these enemies that come down, and uh, obviously they can kill you if you touch them, but they are also collecting the pellets or the gems. And uh, so any pellet they collect, you don't collect, and so you don't get as many points. And then uh, if you collect the very last pellet on the screen, you get a bonus. But uh, if you let the enemies collect the last gem, then you lose that point bonus. So that's a pretty cool uh, mechanic. And then down here is this game Stargate. And Stargate is actually the sequel to Defender. So uh, Eugene Jarvis designed Defender. Then uh, he left Williams to start his own company. And then the first game that he designed at his own company, uh, it was called VidKids, by the way, the company, uh, was uh, this game Stargate. And, uh, and then he turned around and licensed it to Williams and they released it in the arcade. So I thought that was kind of bizarre. But um, in the arcade, you know, Stargate is a, you know, marginal improvement over uh, Defender. It's got some additional enemies and uh, it's got some additional uh, gameplay mechanics. And, uh, you know, in the arcade, I mean, it is an improvement, uh, you know, incremental improvement over Defender. But what's really noteworthy about Stargate, in my opinion, is that the home version of this game is also excellent. So while Defender on the 2600, uh, you know, was kind of a dumpster fire, uh, the home version of Stargate is uh, is really, really good. So if you're looking for uh, a Defender type game to play at home, you definitely want to grab Stargate instead. And uh, one of the cool things about Stargate, you know, as I mentioned about Defender, it, it's kind of a complicated game as far as the controls go. And with Stargate, you actually plug in the second controller and use that as well, like to, to activate a smart bomb or activate Invisio or hyperspace. You use the second joystick to do that, which, uh, which is pretty neat. Over here, uh, we've got the kids cartridge report. And uh, I don't know anything about Oscar's Trash Race. Uh, I haven't played it, so I'm not really going to talk about it. But uh, but Taz up here, uh, I have played this game, and there, there's really not that much about it that makes you feel like you're playing a game that's sort of based in the in the Looney Tunes universe. There's like I don't know eight or so levels where um, there is food scrolling through those paths, and there's also sticks of dynamite, and you have to move uh, between those levels and pick up all the food and but you also have to obviously avoid the sticks of dynamite and you know i know that you know part of the thing with taz in the cartoons was that he had this voracious appetite and he would eat anything uh you know but other than that i don't really see what about the game has anything to do uh with the cartoon and then even the little uh sprite that is the tasmanian devil is him in sort of that you know hurricane uh form or vortex form so you don't ever really get to see uh, Taz, although I'm not sure that would have really looked very good. But uh, yeah, Taz, Taz is an okay, okay game, but not great. The controls kind of stink. Uh, like you can push up to go up one level, but somehow you'll jump two levels instead and get killed by a stick of dynamite. So uh, definitely a uh, skippable game. Over here is just an ad to get people to join, uh, join the Atari Club, um, which was only a dollar, which is pretty cheap. If you filled one of these out and sent them in thinking you were going to get a subscription to Atari Age, uh, you were going to get a Root Awakening. Uh, well, this is pretty neat. So here uh, they've gotten uh, here's some more stuff you could order from the Atari Club. But this is all Atari Olympic merchandise. And uh, some of this stuff would have been really cool to have. They've got a baseball cap. They've got, uh, you know, a beanie or a ski cap or toque if you're uh, Canadian. Uh, coffee mugs, pins, keychain, patch. Uh, sweatshirt, golf shirt, t-shirt. Like, man, I would love to have like one of these coffee mugs or something. That would be pretty cool. I should look on eBay for one of those. Uh, over here, Atari uncovers valuable legacy. Many of the hottest cartridges Atari produces are adaptations of arcade games, but there's plenty of originality to be found at Sunnyvale. Uh, anyway, so I've never played this game. It's this game called Final Legacy that uh, at some point was going to be released on the Atari 5200. They even say here tentative and the game never came out on the 5200. It just came out on uh, the eight bit computers, the 400 and the 800. Um, I've never played it. I've never owned uh, an Atari home computer, so I can't really say anything about it. 
Uh, down here, they uh, talk about Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper was a, a Taito arcade game uh, in which you play the role of, uh, of a zookeeper named uh, Zeke, who is saving his girlfriend who's named Zelda. Someone was saving their girlfriend Zelda. That sounds kind of familiar. Um, but uh, you'd moved around sort of the periphery of the screen, building up this brick wall to like hold the animals inside the zoo and uh, also dodging animals that had gotten outside of the brick wall. And uh, it's really not a bad game at all. And um, it says down here, this frantic arcade fun of Zookeeper is scheduled for release on the Atari 2600. But uh, sadly, the game uh, never made it past sort of the planning stages. Over here, uh, this is a, a, a whole article about uh, the creation of Crystal Castles. So that's pretty cool because this is sort of reminiscent of the kind of articles you'd see in a magazine like Retro Gamer. Once again, I really don't have much experience playing this game, so uh, I don't really have any anything to comment on. Here we get into some of the real sports games, and uh, specifically they talk about real sports baseball and real sports football. And uh, these were not, I know real sports baseball was definitely not the first baseball game uh, for the 2600. I think Home Run was. There was also a Pete Rose baseball for the 2600. And there were probably other baseball games for the 2600 that I don't, I don't know about. It's really not that bad of a game. It doesn't seem like it reviews very well. But um, having played it, I don't think it's that bad at all. Uh, even even playing it single player, you know, uh, you know, you, you got to keep your expectations in check when you know you're playing a, a sports game on a system like the Atari. But uh, I didn't think it was bad. And uh, real sports football, which they're talking about over here. That one I don't think is uh, is very good at all, and uh, you know I don't. I'd have to think about in my mind like how would you design a good football game for the Atari? Maybe it's just too complicated. I don't know, but uh, that game's definitely not very very good in my opinion. But again, real sports baseball, uh, really not bad in my opinion. Uh, here's just an ad for some of the games they've got coming out. It's just a cool ad. It's very colorful and it has some cool artwork here. But it's a cool looking ad here. Uh, you get to see the box art and whatnot. Uh, there's Stargate, Crystal Castles, and uh, and Millipede. Uh, I'd really like to pick up a copy of Stargate. Obviously, I can, I can play it on a Harmony cartridge, but that's a game I wouldn't mind having an original of. Uh, in here, we just get into uh, some computer coverage, and it's kind of funny because the whole point of this article, you know, ostensibly is to educate the reader about, you know, what really a home computer is and what it can do for you. But, you know, really the point of the article, understandably, is uh, to try to get you to buy an Atari home computer. Uh, over here, uh, this is Coin Video Corner, and they talk about uh, Firefox, which was this game that was released in the arcade. And in fact, as you can see down here, it was released as both a stand-up or a sit-down cabinet. And uh, I had never heard of this game before reading this magazine. Apparently, Firefox was a Clint Eastwood movie from like 1982. Uh, I'd never heard of that either. And uh, this has the distinction of being the only laserdisc based game that Atari ever developed for uh, for the arcade. You know, when when you think of uh, laserdisc uh, arcade games, you think of like Dragon's Lair or Space Ace. And I didn't realize that Atari had made a laserdisc based game. You're really just moving an aiming reticle around the screen and blowing up uh, enemy ships. But the reason that it uses a laser disc is because all of the background uh, footage is actual footage from the movie. And then uh, over here, this is just kind of funny. So, I, you know, this this was the uh, March April issue. So I guess for uh, April Fool's Day, they put this little insert in here called "Not the Atari Age," an unofficial goof from the Atari Club. And uh, like on the cover here, the nuclear joystick, the ultimate controller. So, I mean, that's that's pretty funny here. And um, uh, Atari to introduce the world's hardest video game. And, uh, you know, it just talks about how impossible the game is. I don't really know how it's not really that funny if I read all this kind of stuff to you. But uh, if you can find a, a scan uh, of this magazine, maybe on Retro Mags or something, it's worth checking out. Other things they have here, games that really smell. And they were, they were basically going to release, like, you know, a smell a vision game. And, uh, and then they even say here, the first game announced for the new system um, is Big Bird's Rotten Egg Catch. So that's pretty funny. And then Centipede, but Centipede spelled uh, S-C-E-N-T. 
and uh, Big Brother is playing, and they're gonna they have a game that's coming out where I guess the game is gonna be watching you, which I guess whatever. But then over here, I thought this was part, kind of cool. So they have the the Clubhouse Store, which they call the Clubhouse Snore, and uh, you can get this gem stick controller, which is like a bedazzled controller for uh, 1.2 million dollars. Super powerful remote control joystick. Is the 20 foot range of the Atari remote wireless joystick too short for you? Want to get real long distance control? Here's your once in a lifetime chance. A remote control joystick transmitter, which sends a signal 500 miles. Formerly radio station WSTK in Ferndale, Illinois. It comes complete with two joysticks, cable, airplane warning lights. Note, requires 18,000 size C batteries, not included. All right, now we get back to uh, to uh, the real stuff here. Uh, so they got this uh, master contest news. So uh, you know, I mentioned that this uh, you know video game masters competition, whatever, yeah, video game masters, uh, extended over uh, multiple issues. And uh, in the previous issue, it the uh, the game was Quadrun, which uh, I know very little about Quadrun. I haven't really played it that much. Quadrun was a game that was. Uh, an Atari Club exclusive, which basically just meant that you could only get this game uh, by ordering it through the mail. Some people have said that you could later on uh, get this game in stores like it was a limited release. Uh, I don't know anything about that, but uh, it's definitely one of the pricier Atari games if for some reason you wanted to pick it up now. I think the thing that Quadrun is really most known for is the fact that it has digitized voice. It was the first Atari game to have digitized voice. Quadrant, Quadrant, Quadrant. Then they talk down here about um, uh, Gravatar. They say that that uh, Gravatar was the game for the first video game masters competition, and uh, Gravatar was another game that for a while was a uh, Atari Club exclusive, and the only way you could get it was um, you know was through the mail, and uh, and at that time it was a silver labeled cartridge, and once again some of those silver labeled cartridges may have trickled out to stores. But unlike Quadrun, uh, Gravatar was re-released uh, with the red label uh, much later in stores. So if you get the silver label Gravatar, that one's rare. But uh, if you get the red label, it's not rare. But uh, Gravatar is uh, a really good game. This was another uh, arcade game. Uh, this, it was an Atari, you know, first-party arcade game. In the arcade, it was another vector game, uh, full-color vector game like uh, like Space Duel. And, uh, you know, obviously not a vector game uh, when it came uh, to the home. But so the cool thing about Gravatar, uh, it gets its name uh, because it had gravity in the game. So when you start the game up, you had this view of like the solar system. And the point of the game is that you have to go visit each of the planets and basically destroy the planet. So you would you would you fly. And once you get to a planet, your view changes and then you're, you know, within sort of the atmosphere of the planet. And there were these little bases that were like shooting at you and you had to destroy all of those bases while not crashing into the planet. And you also had to pick up like uh, fuel cells or fuel pods because you're constantly using your thruster uh, just to maneuver around, but also to fight gravity. And that's using up your fuel. And if you use up all your fuel, you would you would die. And so you had to keep collecting these fuel pods uh, on the surfaces of these planets and then once you destroyed uh, the last base and got all the fuel, you would fly out of the planet's atmosphere, and after you did, the planet would, would be destroyed. And once you cleared out one entire solar system, you would move on to the next. There would be planets that you could still move all the way around uh, so that you were still being pulled towards the center of the screen instead of just down, which uh, was kind of a cool uh, little addition that they had. But... Uh, Gravatar is a really cool game. If you can play the arcade game, uh, you should. But also, if you're somebody that has an Atari and is looking for a game to play, uh, I recommend Gravatar for sure. Uh, over here is just the order form again, which is the exact same format as the other order form. So we probably don't need to really look at that. Uh, this is like I was talking about earlier. You had these ARCs, which uh, I think that's... I don't know what that stands for, actually. ARC. Oh, Atari Redemption Certificate. So when you would order stuff through them, uh, you would get a, a certain number of these ARCs based on how much money you spent. And then you could turn around and use that money uh, towards future orders. So that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, over here, 
Uh, their contest for this month was that you just had to identify games based on these close-up screenshots. So, I mean, that looks pretty simple. I think that's Moon Patrol, Miss Pac-Man, Pole Position, uh, Defender, Joust, and Berserk. So, uh, I guess the point wasn't for it to be difficult. Uh, first prize this month was an Atari 800XL home computer. So, that's pretty cool. Uh, here they had some fan art that people sent in, so that's pretty neat. And um, over here they just have, uh, here's an ad for some uh, games that have been discounted. So this is pretty pretty interesting to look at. So remember, this is two years, uh, a little bit less than two years actually, after the first magazine we looked at. And you remember Defender was $37.95. Here you can get it now for only $9.95, which at least to me speaks to the fact that it really wasn't a very good game. Same thing down here, though. Uh, Yar's Revenge, which which was a good game, was also marked all the way down uh, to nine ninety five. So you know, certainly, if you want to pick up some games on the cheap, there were quite a few good games here for uh, for only ten bucks. Here's some more stuff that they're trying to sell you. They've still got the T-shirts here, and uh, but it seems like here, uh, oh, these are free T-shirts. So if you bought um, either Dig Dug. Or a real sports cartridge, you got the appropriate uh, T-shirt for that. But uh, I think this is Dig Dug. Oh, they had Dig Dug for both the 2600 and the 5200. So 30 bucks on the 2600, 37 bucks for the 5200. So you know, but that makes sense. And then over here they've got the uh, remote control wireless joysticks. Those have become somewhat of a collector's item. Uh, the ROM scanner, which is kind of like a video game brain, so you could have multiple cartridges plugged in and then switch between them. That'd be kind of cool to have, I guess. I mean, how much work is it to change a cartridge? But it's just kind of, uh, you know, cool technology-wise. Uh, Atari carrying case. This would be really cool to have. The official Atari scoreboard, which appears to just be a little dry erase board, but uh, just because of the artwork on it and whatnot, like I would love to have something like that just to hang up on the wall. And uh, here's just more, more stuff here. Uh, this is 5200 stuff. They don't... I think they don't say, I was hoping they would say how much a 5200 system cost, but uh, I don't see it here anywhere. But uh, here's the, they have the adapter so you could play 2600 games on your 5200. Uh, that was 60 bucks, which is not cheap. But uh, I guess if you never had a 2600, then, I mean, that would, I guess, still be a pretty good deal. And then uh, down here is the Atari 5200 trackball controller, which, uh, which unlike the 2600 controller, that one, I believe, is analog. And then over here, they've just got some Atari uh, home computer stuff for sale. And, uh, and there you go. On the back cover there is a uh, little ad for Stargate, which, uh, as I said, is, uh, is really a great game. One of the best games, I would say, uh, on the Atari 2600. So, uh, so that is the last issue of Atari Age. And we'll put the, uh, there's the first issue again there. So, uh, you know, pretty cool. Obviously not very thick magazines, as we've said. And I guess the one standout thing that I would say about uh, these Atari Age magazines is that you'll notice that uh, the only games covered in these magazines were first-party releases. Unlike, if you think of, like, Nintendo Power, they would still cover third-party games, you know, like Contra or Ghosts and Goblins or whatever. And, you know, the reason for that is that, you know, all those games on, like, the Nintendo, those companies were still paying a licensing fee to Nintendo. So Nintendo was benefiting from sales of those games. And probably rightfully, they knew that uh, having those games on their system was going to help sell uh, consoles. But, you know, with the Atari 2600, there, there was no licensing fee. Anybody could develop games for the 2600 and release them, which is really part of what caused its downfall. Uh, but for that reason, I think Atari felt uh, no need to advertise games from companies like like Imagic or uh, Activision. And it's really too bad because during this time, you know, 82 to 84, there were a lot of great games released on the Atari uh, by companies like uh, Imagic and Activision and Parker Brothers. And it would have been cool to see some of that uh, covered in here. But uh, for obvious reasons, it wasn't. So that's going to do it uh, for this read-through uh, of Atari Age, issue number one from May and June of 1982. And uh, volume two, number five, which was issue number 11 from March and April of 1984. 
That's going to do it for this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.